Hey what's up guys, welcome back to Archihacks and today we have another very exciting tutorial. So today we're going to be creating this atmospheric rendering using Rhino, V-Ray and Photoshop. Even though we're using Rhino, if you have V-Ray and Photoshop, you can probably do this with other programs like SketchUp. And if you want to learn more about the design process about this project, feel free to check out the link right up here or in the description to see how we design this building. So everything you're going to be seeing in today's video will be done on a Precision 3650 Tower, which is the Dell's latest computer that is designed specifically for creative workers, such as people who are working on 2D and 3D graphics. And that obviously includes architectural designers. And this video is jam-packed with tips to optimize your workflow, so make sure to stick around till the end to learn all about it. For those who are new to the channel, we post helpful videos like this one on a regular basis, so if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and like this video so that more of it will show up on your feed. That being said, we have a lot to cover, so let's dive right into it. Okay, so here we are in Rhino. As you can see, the model is quite large and has a decent level of detail and requires a bit of a heavy lifting on the hardware side. And yeah, large models like these could take up quite a bit of overhead storage. Thankfully, Precision Tower provides you with all the power that you can possibly need. So this particular model of Precision Tower is configured with whopping 64 gigabytes of RAM, and this can be increased to 128 gigabytes. So for those who are working with large Revit models or creating animation, these RAM will be instrumental in your workflow. So the first thing I would do is to find the right perspective for the job. And as you may have seen on our preview, our camera was located somewhere down the alley right over here. And I'll try to place the camera as close to the street level as possible. And yeah, that looks pretty good. And then I'm going to go ahead and save this view to our named view panel and call this street level and say OK. So if we lose this perspective, we can always double click and come back to this view. And next, I'm going to try to set up the lighting as closely as possible. I'm going to go ahead over to our V-Ray asset editor. This is going to be our rendering engine of choice. I will go ahead, enable our Rhino Document Sun and choose custom orientation. And to preview how our scene looks like, we're going to go ahead and click on the interactive rendering. So what's cool about interactive rendering is that your viewport updates immediately as you tweak different settings. So if I increase the vertical angle of our sun, you can see that this viewport quickly shows you what this will look like. Um, to make your performance even better, I would recommend going over to your settings and choosing the RTX tab if it's available on your computer. Precision Tower comes with either Radeon or Nvidia graphics card that enables RTX rendering. And this particular type of rendering reduces the render time by a significant amount. And yeah, this will really help out with the overall workflow. So let's go ahead and fire up the interactive rendering. Let's go over to our lighting tab again and start playing around. Adjust the settings until you get it just right, and then we are ready to move on to the final render. And for that, I'm going to go ahead and enable a couple channel. I've already enabled a few, um, as you can see, but the ones that I'm going to be using are geometry normals and random material color. And I'll quickly explain this later when we get to our Photoshop. And for now, I'm going to go ahead and set up our render output. Let's go choose 4K resolution. We will turn off interactive rendering, turn off progressive, and then enable our denoiser. And let's choose NVIDIA AI to do the job. If you find your image way too overexposed or underexposed, you can go over to the camera tab and adjust your exposure value. So for me, I've set it to 13.4, but try things out with the interactive rendering and find the right value for your scene. Okay, whenever you're ready, I think we're good to render. So when that's ready, I'm gonna go ahead over to the file and click on save all image channels to a separate files. Okay, so when your rendering has been finished, you can import three images. One is the bump normal, the other one is effects result, and the last one is the material color. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy everything over. Quick way to do this is by ripping out your viewport like that and holding down shift, you can drag and drop your image and it'll land exactly in place. So I'll repeat the process for the other one. And there we go. So just to quickly give you an idea of what these channels are, bump normal colors the objects depending on the direction each geometry is facing. 
So for example, all the geometries that are facing towards the camera are in a bluish tint, and all the geometries that are pointing towards the left are mostly pink, and all the geometry that's pointing to the top gets closer to green color. So this allows us to select a particular face or direction of, of our scene and relight them if it's necessary. For the material random, they assign different color to different materials. So for example, all the default material are shown as cyan in this particular instance. And most of the red glass elements are showing up as this beige or yellowish tone. So with that in mind, let's go back to our original scene and do some photoshopping. So the first thing I kind of want to do is color correction. I'm noticing that there are parts of the building that are really dark. I'm going to go over to curves, clip this onto our original rendering and increase the black area just a little bit like so and then normalize the rest of the curvature. The next thing I want to do is that I'm going to make this whole thing black and white and that allows us to be carefree about colors. This rendering is all about efficiency and delivering the mood as fast as possible. So we will show you some shortcuts to doing that. And black and white is a good first step to remove any complications without reducing the final result. The second thing I might want to do is I'm going to add a background sky to this image. To do so, I like to use unsplash.com and you can search for anything here. I'm going to choose sky and scroll down to the free images. And the image that I chose for that sample rendering is this one. So I'm going to go ahead and right click and save or you can download for free to get a high resolution image. So let's drag and drop this into our Photoshop file. Let's make sure everything fits across our canvas. When it's ready, you can hit enter and place this all the way at the bottom. All right, and the highlight of this visualization comes from the atmospheric fog. And to do so, I'm going to go ahead and create a new layer and start painting in some gray color to prime the canvas for the job. As you can see, our model was not the most perfect model. And that's actually why we added a lot of fog in the beginning, but it actually added so much to the mood and atmosphere that I think it turned out for better. So sometimes it's not all about detailing out everything. It's about kind of picking and choosing what feels right for you and choosing your own poison. So I'm going to go ahead and start painting in this area with maybe about 80% brush. And this part doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to cover this up do the same thing here. And while you're selecting brush tool, you can hold down alt to start sampling some colors from the scene. Okay, so yeah, now that we have made a bit of a censorship area right there, I'm going to go ahead and create another layer. We'll call this layer primer. And on top of it, we will create a foreground fog and head over to the brush tool again. So when you right click, click on the gear icon you'll find the import brushes menu. And from here, you can import the brush you can download from the link and come back to this video. So you have imported a brush. The new brush should show up at the bottom like so. And you can select either of these. They're both really good. I'm going to choose the first one and show you what this looks like. So this particular brush is like um, a static image of a kind of wispy cloud. But what's cool is that they randomized the output so that it gives you a really organic look no matter how you paint. So for example, I just go ahead and start brushing in the foreground like so. As you can see, it looks totally organic and looks like yeah, you can almost not recognize any repetition. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and start painting in some foreground element. As you may have seen from our preview, um, our foreground is extremely dark and we kind of wanted to imply that like the light is shining on the building and everything else is like super dark and gloomy. So to create that, I'm going to use black brush to add in some foreground fog and then bring in some more in the middle ground right over here. Actually, general rule of thumb, it's better to work from the back to the front. So I'm going to do that instead. As you're going further away from your camera, you should also adjust your fog size so that it becomes a little bit more realistic in terms of scale and just the way like fog behaves in real life. And um, yeah, one thing I wanted to do was I wanted to create the effect where the light is coming through this hole over here. So to do that, I'm going to create more contrast by darkening up the rest of the building. So this is where the normal comes useful. I'm going to go ahead and click on this normal map and go over to magic wand and start selecting some faces will be selected and I can start painting in some colors. So to do that, I'm going to add in a layer right over here. And just like fill it in actually, because we're going to adjust the opacity layer. I'll repeat the same process for this building. Like so. 
Okay, when that's ready, I'm gonna try playing with the opacity until it looks right. I think that's pretty good already, actually. Just a little bit lighter. Okay, good. And I'll do the same thing for this face right over here. And for this, I'm gonna paint in slightly lighter color, so maybe 40% opacity. It looks pretty good. And so. I'll continue painting in the brushes to kind of hide the imperfections. I also want to do is to kind of fix up the glass area just a little bit so as you can see and this is where material ID comes in useful so I'm gonna go ahead and select all the material that corresponds to glass and when you turn off contiguous option right over here you're able to select the whole scene at the same time so I'm gonna go ahead and do that I think that about selects all the glass elements so I will go back to our scene and on top of our curved adjustment, no, maybe on top of the hue and saturation, I'm going to start painting in areas that I think could be a little lighter and areas where I think the glass can be a little bit more opaque. So right now it's really hard to see everything because of the marching ant selection. This is where I like to use Ctrl H to hide the selection. Once you do so, your painting will be limited to that area. So as you can see, my brush only affects the glasses. So in this particular scene, the sun will be coming from the left side into this face of the building. So I'm going to go ahead and paint in building facades that are facing in that direction. So for example, over here, and I'm going to lower the opacity just a little bit to get the right color. That looks pretty good. And if you are done with your editing, you can always choose Control D to deselect your selection and kind of go back to normal before you forget. Okay, so I'm gonna say window tint. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and group all these elements together just to clean things up. So all this building and the rest is background and whatever that's on top will be the foreground. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new layer. This is going to be glow and I'll choose a gradient tool and draw a gradient that's sort of pointing towards the top, sort of like that. And then change the blending mode to screen. So in the beginning it might be a little too bright so I'm going to reduce the opacity to about 40% and one more thing I might want to do is I want to add like a slight lens flare so I'm gonna go over to unsplash again and search for lens flare and scroll down to the free area and this is a particular image that I chose that we're gonna just copy over and paste to isolate one of the suns so I'll delete that one and choose Control M to bring up the curves adjustment and uh, I'm gonna increase the black side just a little bit so that we don't have any harsh edges I know it looks super harsh but when we turn this into a screen blending mode black will disappear so yeah so we'll say okay and change the blending mode to screen and we will rotate and place this so that it kind of corresponds to our glare that we added. Make this extremely large. Little bit of detail. And that has also introduced a bit of a color, which I'm okay with, but if we want to just really keep this monochromatic, then we can reduce the saturation for this as well. And better yet, 
if you want to preserve the original image, we can just go, we can just bring up the hue and saturation that we created earlier. Just put it on top and it gets applied to all the layers below. So I'm gonna group all these guys and call this effects and boom. That is pretty much it. Now we're gonna go ahead and save this image. And this was a 4K image, right? When you're saving a large file, sometimes Photoshop won't let you save it as a JPEG image. So as you can see in this example, um, it doesn't let you do that. So what you have to do at that time is save as a copy option. And this is also available when you're trying to save. So on the right side, it says save as copy. And if you drop down now, you'll see all the available format. This shows up decently on a printed format with like 150 DPI. But if you want to print at a 300 DPI, like a um, poster scale, you might want to render everything at a 8K or more. And that means the Photoshop file can take up to a gigabyte per Photoshop file. But thankfully, Dell's precision towers come with three expandable hard drive slots, and it can be pre-configured with up to 32 terabytes of SSD and hard drive. Pretty insane stuff. So yeah, even on the storage side, precision provides you with ample amount of storage that you could ever need. Okay, so that's how we made that rendering. I hope you guys learned a lot about improvising with uh, complicated models and working with heavy files. And of course, again, thank you Dell for sponsoring this video and sending us the machine. We are happy to report that it is a solid, powerful and reliable machine that we can easily recommend to all students and professionals out there. So those who are looking for a reliable desktop, go ahead and take a look in the link in the description. So that being said, it's been Ben from Archihacks and I'll see you guys in the next one.